Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today is Clark Neely, Senior Vice President for Legal Studies at the Cato Institute. Welcome back to the show, Clark. Good to be with you, Trevor. So we've had a, a uptick in mass shootings over the past month or so, uh, which of course produces a discussion about gun violence, as it should. Uh, and I think we'd sort of start by going and saying there's an unfortunate tendency of gun rights supporters to kind of throw up hands and say, we really can't do anything about this. Uh, and that seems to be the wrong, at least the wrong approach. I think that's right. I think it's wrong both as a policy matter. It's it's wrong morally as well. Um, on I think two things are true. On the one hand, we've done a lot and we've seen uh, gun deaths plummet in the last several decades. Homicides are down. Um, obviously, there's been an uptick lately, but that seems to be to some extent associated with COVID. But on balance, we've seen a significant decrease in homicides, including gun homicides, also deaths by gun accident. Um, suicides, I think, are a kind of a separate category, very troubling uh, issue that we'll get into. Um, but we've, we've, we actually have adopted um, smart policies with respect to guns. Um, and you know, it's, it, it makes me think, for example, of traffic fatalities. Those are down as well over roughly the same time. Um, and you know, I don't think anybody thinks that we're ever going to get to a world where there are no traffic fatalities. And I think getting to a world where there are no gun fatalities is similarly impossible. But the idea that there's nothing further we can do, or even that there's nothing further we can do in a kind of a you know, cost-effective way, um, I'm not persuaded by that, even if some people have exaggerated the ability of public policy to you know, further reduce gun deaths. I think the truth lies in the middle somewhere. Yes, and it, it's a complex question. And one of my frustrations in this debate is that there is a tendency to focus on guns uh, when actually the problems are multifaceted, and we can we can see what gun was used by the last shooter, and we could ban that gun. And I've of, often made this analogy to immigration restrictions because on the on the anti-immigrant side, they do a similar thing. If an immigrant commits a crime, then they see how he got into the country and then go after that loophole. And if someone does a shooting, a horrific shooting with a certain type of gun, we go after that gun. And that's not the most productive way of, I think, addressing especially the mass shooters problem because they are highly motivated. This is this is the difficulty of doing gun policy that uh, a a given policy proposal around guns will affect the marginal criminal like there it is this is one of the big fallacies that gun rights supporters i think commit saying you know guns don't cause crime people cause crime guns absolutely can cause crime in the following way there is someone out there who is too scared to rob a 711 with a knife or with their bare hands and so if you give them a gun it gives them the ability to project force over a distance which is the most important characteristic of a gun both in terms of using it for violence or using it for self defense it's the same characteristic and you give them that gun and then they decide to commit a crime that they wouldn't have committed before that is not a mass shooter in almost every circumstance but that is not a person who is just on the edge of maybe committing a crime they plan for a very long time and so trying to come up with a gun policy to address mass shooting is probably not going to be as effective as other possibilities. Yeah, I think that's self-evidently true. And, you know, not to be pedantic, but really we cannot ban guns. We can prohibit them. Um, but look, we do that with many different kinds of illicit drugs. And does that mean that those drugs no longer exist or that people no longer are able to acquire those drugs? Absolutely not. Um, and we know that noncompliance with gun laws um, is rampant. There's been a lot of study of this uh, that has been done, and that doesn't entitle you to just throw up your hands and say, well, then I guess there's nothing we can do. But it, I think it does require that you be realistic about it. And you know, just to give an example, I mean, um, there's a reason why AR-15s have become so popular um, in, um, you know, with certain gun owners in the modern era. Um, and it's because a lot of, well, one of the reasons is that a lot of people have come back from service in the U.S. military uh, where they have been trained on a similar platform. They're very comfortable uh, with that style of weapon. Um, it has, of course, uh, certain real advantages uh, for for personal protection. Um, it's unfortunate to see so many people sort of poo-poo the idea that a so-called assault weapon, and specifically an AR-15, you know, 
um, that the idea that it has no real use uh, for personal protection is it's it's just been that that has been falsified over and over again. It's not ideal for every situation, but there are some situations and some um, owners for whom it is ideal. So um, the idea uh, that we can just pass a law and then suddenly you know uh, by prohibiting AR-15s they will all disappear um, has been uh, falsified time and time again and. You know, we have to ask ourselves a really stark question, I think, and that is, in a given jurisdiction, if you, if if you get to the point where you know you ban uh, so-called assault weapons, are you really ready to start putting soccer moms and uh, Iraq and Afghan war veterans who are otherwise law-abiding in every way? You're really re ready to start putting them in prison for years or even decades? I don't think we are. And if you don't do that, then your only other alternatives are to just not enforce the law at all. Which is, of course, a disastrous policy choice, or and this is what we do with drugs: um, enforce it against a particular demographic that you know sort of has the least ability to push back in the political process, and you know various attributes that make it easier to um, sort of single them out for the adverse consequences of this uh, uh, partial enforcement policy. Uh, and and uh, you know, look, if you think that racial disparities in the enforcement of drug laws are objectionable, and they are. You should see the racial disparities in the enforcement of gun laws. They're even worse, and that's unconscionable. Yes, and uh, we often forget that uh, Mayor Bloomberg's stop and frisk program was ostensibly a gun control program, and it was used in an incredibly racially discriminatory way with a, basically a pretext to stop almost any often young black male on the street to see if they have a gun and, and all their kind of malfeasance that arose from that. And I agree with you completely. The assault weapons thing, it's its just, it's frustrating. Uh, first of all, to say that there's a certain type of gun that is kind of whatever, meant only for death or meant only to kill, uh, that that's not true about any gun. Guns are, all guns are dangerous. They all can be used for self-defense and mayhem. Uh, an assault weapon, we're kind of doing scare quotes when we talk about this because Clark and I know that's not really a category of guns. And there, we talk about the AR-15, there's about 5 million out there. And clearly it's not only good for mayhem because vast, huge amounts of police officers have an AR-15 in their trunk for which they use it to protect the lawful protection of self and others. And if, and there'd be no, if it was only good for spraying death, then that would not be true. And assault, assault weapons, we could talk about that ban. Uh, generally, they're defined mostly aesthetically uh, with a barrel, like the 94 ban had one of two characteristics, whether it had, a pist it had to be a semi-automatic rifle with a pistol grip, a ba barrel shroud, a bayonet lug, a collapsible stock. Uh, and th these are the kind of non, they're not, functionally making the weapon more lethal. Now, why are shooters preferring this weapon? My theory, because I've read too many of their journals, which I don't advise, uh, but I, my theory is that they are uh, emulating the Columbine murders. Uh, and that's they, the Columbine murders who kind of started off the modern tragic uh, trend of school shootings are still considered to be almost heroes uh, to these murderers. And that's the kind of weapon that they used. And they're doing it to be ostentatious to some degree, um, in my theory. It's hard to say, of course, but they're doing it to be somewhat ostentatious um, because they want to look the part that is in their head. But of course, getting into these people's head is, is no fun. Um, and it's such a small number that it's hard to even extrapolate a trend. Yeah, and it's important for people to understand if they don't know this already that it is still the case that the majority of uh, mass shootings, which is not uh, an easy um, term to define, really, um, but the mass majority of uh, of, of mass shootings um, have been committed um, with handguns. Handguns are um, easier, by and large, to obtain. Um, they are much easier to conceal, and uh, frankly, when you're when you're shooting. Uh, unarmed uh, people, um, it doesn't really matter that much what kind of weapon uh, you're using um, when you're, you know, uh, shooting people who can't defend themselves. So, um, but there is a tendency, I think, I think um, for, for a variety of reasons, I think this sort of concept of assault weapons has certainly been polarizing. Um, it, it arouses uh, probably the, you know, the most passion um, in the discussion. And um, I think it's, I think, I think that both sides, must be careful not to dismiss the concerns uh, of the other. That includes us, I suppose, even though we kind of think of ourselves as, as perhaps being in the middle somewhere. Um, but um, to go back to an earlier point, I think the idea um, that that you can realistically um, eliminate from a given jurisdiction or largely eliminate from a given jurisdiction, um, uh, you know, sort of every 
AR-15 looking weapon um, is unrealistic. And in part because of what it would take to do that. And that would include imposing severe punishments. I'm talking about life and family destroying punishments on people who have not committed any sort of an immoral act. There's nothing immoral about owning a particular weapon, just as there's nothing immoral uh, about possessing or even ingesting a particular intoxicant. The behavior that you engage in after ingesting that intoxicant or the behavior that you engage in with a particular weapon can certainly be immoral, but the act of owning a particular weapon or the act of owning a particular um, uh, or consuming a particular uh, uh, con intoxicant is not itself immoral. And it's, it is a, an incredibly fraught question when you propose inflicting savage punishments um, on people, not because of the, um, the harm that they've done or the immorality of what they've done, but simply to discourage them and others from engaging in particular conduct like owning a weapon that you don't think they should own. Um, I, again, I don't think that we have the stomach for that as a society. And I think therefore that these prohibitory uh, approaches, the prohibitory response is unlikely um, to really to materially um, ameliorate the harms that, that, that they're going for. I just don't think they're practical. I agree. And it, I think it's become more common over the last 20 years, because there's a subtext to the gun debate, which is that it's really part of the culture wars. It's become that way in a way that's different, that I think was different, say, in the early 60s, where you had shooting clubs in high schools, you know, in New York State or something like this. And now there's a, I often ask crowds, especially if I suspect they're kind of against guns, like when I give a speech, a couple of questions. One, who is disgusted by guns? And I get a fair amount of hands for that, that they actually, their, their reaction to a gun is a version of disgust. And that and they, they use language that treats guns like a pollutant, right? We have guns polluting our campuses, polluting our culture. And I've been around people, some of my European friends, you know, one time they were at my parents' house and they kind of whispering to each other and they said, does your dad have a gun? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, yes. Like, uh, and so... They asked to see it, so I bring it. It's a little revolver. I bring it out, you know, hold it out in my hand, and they all kind of re recoil back like it's a you know coiled up cobra or something. Um, so th that's a difficult. So those are people who never grew up around guns, and that's a difficult emotion to argue against from a matter of public policy. Uh, yes, there are people who have guns. You know, there, I know people who are who have said they don't want to come into my house because there are guns in my house, like that kind of attitude. Um, and then the other question I ask uh, when I give speeches is who thinks that a civilized, whatever that means, society would have no guns in private hands? This is kind of the Star Trek question where you say, oh, look at Star Trek. They all treat the time when people owned guns as some sort of primitive, barbaric time. And so what we should be moving towards as just a method of civilizing is the slow elimination of guns in private hands. Let's say I accept that premise. I don't. Uh, I mean, if, if only the government has guns, we have different problems. But let's say I accept that premise. Well, it's not going to happen in America. It's just, it's not. 400 million guns, at least. You could, even as, as you said, Clark, doing it with the criminal justice system would be a civil liberties violations to the point of, of just insanity to try and do this. Um, and so you have to start at this baseline where say it's not going to happen. We have 400 million guns. Guns themselves are not disgusting. You don't have to own one, but for most people, it's an inert piece of steel in their house that they occasionally shoot. And on the criminal justice side is, it reminds me of living here in Virginia and the legislator was discussing expanding gun prohibitions and they had done it to a point that one of the laws that was suggested was that it would be a single factor test for an assault weapon. So rather than having, having to have two of these characteristics, would only have to have one of which one of them was a bayonet, a bayonet mount. So I own a M1 carbine used in World War II that is a semi-automatic rifle, and it had a bayonet. It's 70 years old. It's more like 80 years old. It had a bayonet, has a bayonet mount put on it actually after the war. And it just sort of astounded me thinking that if they pass this law, I would suddenly become a felon uh, for possibly 10 years in prison because this 80-year-old rifle in my closet has a bayonet mount on it, which I'm not sure that mass bayoneting is exactly the problem we should be going after. And, and then you suddenly realize, wow, I could become a felon. And that's the reality of gun owners when they start passing laws that don't really do anything in terms of like 
the bayonet mount is not a characteristic that is contributing and rifles themselves are, are killing a vanishingly small amount of the total people who are killed. And so you just wonder why they're doing this. And then again, the hard use of the criminal justice system to go after this problem ends up being, as you said, extremely immoral uh, in the most of its applications. Yeah. I, you know, let's go back to your intriguing uh, counterfactual about a world in which there are no guns. If that were actually something that were um, feasible. Um, you and I certainly believe that it's not. Um, that's in part because of our experience with drug prohibition. We've been, you know, waging that so-called war for more than 50 years. And uh, you look, talk to, <laughs> I talked to, I remember I was uh, teaching, a uh, guest teaching a class of, um, I think, middle school students in Washington, D.C. The teacher was late. I was just chatting with them. And, you know, I, I asked them how easy or difficult it would be for them to get drugs. And they laughed at me because it was easy. And I asked the same question about a gun and they laughed again and said it was easy. So, but let's put that aside and imagine a world in which somehow um, guns have been eliminated. Um, it's not at all clear that this would be a safe or desirable place to live for everybody. Um, violence has always been a part um, of human interaction and it remains so today. Um, some places more so than others, granted. But even in America today, there are people uh, who uh, in effect um, are exposed to the risk of violence um, by virtue of where they live. Or, you know, uh, David French, for example, uh, who writes for the Dispatch and National Review, uh, famously, if you, if you follow his stuff, um, has been subject to uh, so much um, vitriol and stalking um, because of, of his family situation. He and his wife adopted a, uh, a girl from, from Africa. And, um, uh, you know, he tells the story about how they um, they arm themselves and they train to defend themselves and their daughter because of what they've experienced, you know, in terms of not just online, but they've actually had people come to their house. Um, you know, just within the last few days, uh, a man with a gun uh, was arrested outside uh, Brett Kavanaugh's house, uh, Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Now, you know, he has the luxury of armed security provided by the government. Most of us do not. Um, and even something as simple as if you live in one neighborhood in a place like Chicago or New York City, and you have to go through another neighborhood to get to work or to a bus stop, um, you are you can be at great risk simply by virtue of, of being in the wrong neighborhood um, at the wrong time. So, um, and, and of course, that doesn't even get into uh, the issue of uh, women um, who are being stalked um, or attacked by uh, their current or former domestic partner and um, uh, for whom, uh, uh, you know, it's just a fact that, uh, generally speaking, men are bigger and stronger than women. Not always, but but usually. And um, and it's it sounds trite, but it's really not. Um, the ability to own a gun is an equalizing um, factor for many women. It's the only thing that's keeping them safe. And, you know, maybe this is a time to get into this, but um, uh, it is, for those who don't know, it is in fact true that police have no legal duty to protect you. Um, even if you have a restraining order, for example, against a violent um, ex-boyfriend or ex-husband, no duty to enforce that restraining order. If there is uh, uh, someone shooting and killing people at your child's school, like in the tragedy in Uvalde last month, there is no legal duty. The, the police have no legal duty to do anything in that situation. And, and there have been several instances where they have simply stood around outside the school while children were murdered inside. Um, this reason for this is that the Supreme Court has held that it's a matter of, you know, essentially just a default common law rule that uh, the police and other government officials do not have a legal duty um, to protect us. They may if they wish, they may even uh, have a policy of doing so, uh, but there are no legal consequences uh, for failing uh, to protect us. And I think this poses a really serious question, right, to um, those who who favor um aggressive gun control up into and including dispossession, right? Um, if the government is going to take away your ability to defend yourself and your family, um, then while simultaneously saying, and, and we don't have a legal duty to protect you either, um, this raises, I think, profound moral and, and political questions, some of which were explored by our colleague Roger Pallon in an article that you like to cite, uh, and, um, uh, and, and I think should not lightly be dismissed by anybody in this debate or discussion. The self-defense question 
is very interesting and it kind of surprised me when I first started doing gun research for Dave Copel at law school, who sat at the council table uh, at the Supreme Court but during the Heller oral argument, as you did too, Clark, as one of the attorneys there, um, as you were. Um, I was stunned at how any sort of reasonable conservative guess at how many times people defend themselves with guns a year is sort of stunningly high. I mean, you, you'd, you'd think you'd hear more about it or you'd be more common in the news or something like that. And I remember at the time, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics and the National Crime Victimization Survey, which is a horrible way of measuring this, but nevertheless, their number was 110,000 times a year people use a gun and defend themselves. Now, sometimes people treat this as, you know, overinflated and like a lot of the gun control, they dismiss this fact for two reasons. One, they think it's overblown because they are thinking about someone discharging the gun to protect yourself, as opposed to the fact that it's the gun's power means you only have to show it, which would be very different for like a knife. Imagine a small woman, as you pointed out, walking down the street and she has a knife that she could show to a large man who's going to attack her, or she has a gun that she could show. And just showing it is the vast majority of ways that people defend themselves with a gun. But that that 110,000 number is like almost assuredly magnitudes or too low because of the way that the survey was done by the government. And later, Gary Kleck and others did different surveys. So a good conservative estimate is about a million to maybe a million and a half times a year people defend themselves with guns, which is a stunning number. Again, now another problem here with the gun disgust, which I think is dismissed is sort of dismissive by gun control advocates is that they don't like that fact. Even if they accept the number, uh, they wish they don't want people defending themselves with guns because it has this wild west civilization breakdown to it. And I think some part of the gun control position for some people is that they think that that civilization is often teetering on the edge of barbarism and giving people guns as a way of like pushing it over into barbarism, especially letting them carry because they expected, you know, shootouts to be over parking spaces if you let people carry. Not that that doesn't happen occasionally, but much less than the predictions that were said in the 1990s when the when the carry law started being passed. And so they don't like the fact that people are defending themselves with guns. To which I'll say, okay, <laughs> like okay, but but. But nevertheless, these people need to defend themselves, as you pointed out. So there's, this is a good time to tell a powerful story from the, the Heller lawsuit. Um, a lot of people don't realize there are actually six plaintiffs in Heller. Uh, only Dick Heller was found to have standing because of a, a preposterous ruling by the D.C. Circuit um, about standing. But um, one of the plaintiffs was um, a former colleague of ours, Tom Palmer, um, who was then a vice president at Cato and uh, um, happens to be openly gay, uh, which is relevant to the story. He was... Um, pursued and threatened, and he believes nearly murdered by a skinhead mob in California that uh, somehow realized that he was gay and chased after him and were yelling just incredibly ugly things at him about what they were going to do and the fact that no one would find the body when they were done. Um, and I've heard the story a number of times. In fact, Tom related it to me as I put it into an affidavit for the Heller case. And what happened is exactly what you described uh, just now, Trevor, which is that um, when they cornered him, Tom pulled a pistol out of his backpack, and instead of shooting anybody, he simply brandished it. That was enough to cause this entire gang to back up. And this is, this is an astonishing part of the story because it actually gets funny here. You wouldn't think that it would. But as the entire skinhead gang backs up, the leader looks at Tom and says, hey, man, do you have a permit for that? And Tom says, no, but uh, if you don't leave me alone, um, I'll shoot you. And that was, um, he believes that saved his life. Now, of course, none of us were there, but you and I both know him well. And uh, I don't believe that he would exaggerate. And I'm confident that he wouldn't make this up. So it happened as far as I'm concerned. And, um, and I credit his belief that this saved his life. The epilogue to the story, I think, is quite powerful as well, which is that um, the reason he had that pistol was that his mother gave it to him. And she said, Tom, if you're going to be openly gay, I'm afraid that you're going to need this one day. And there was a really powerful brief in the Heller case, an amicus brief by the Pink Pistols, um, which is a gun club for um, gay and lesbian shooting enthusiasts. And part of the Pink Pistols amicus brief was empirical. And what they demonstrated was that um, when people are attacked on the basis of sexual orientation, it's much more likely to involve multiple assailants and horrifyingly much more likely to involve torture and mutilation. So the stakes for someone who is the target of that kind of attack are much higher than for other people. And 
to say to somebody like Tom Palmer, well, you know, if you're pursued by a skinhead mob that wants to kill you and bury the body where no one will ever find it, you're just going to have to sort that out with a 911 call and or some pepper spray um, is at minimum a morally dubious response, right? So where does that leave us, right? You can't wish a world in which there's no violence in which people are never at risk. That's utterly irresponsible. And then the question becomes, well, what is a reasonable accommodation between people who believe that private ownership of guns produces significant uh, harm and social externalities and puts other people at risk, which is not a completely baseless point, versus the point of other people, which is that uh, I have both a right and um, potentially a need to own a, a, a gun in order to effectively uh, defend myself. And just because you've never needed one doesn't mean I never, or I, I have never or will never need one. And so somewhere, you know, in effect, what we have to do as a society is find what is the, the right sort of uh, accommodation between these um, plausible and reasonable concerns on both sides, um, where neither side gets to simply dismiss all of the concerns of the other. And in addition, of course, to, to people of uh, LGBTQ, uh, other minorities, most prominently in America, African Americans have an incredibly important relationship to gun control. In my experience, uh, African Americans like remember uh, more than I think white Americans sort of dismissive of what this condition was like after the Civil War in terms of protecting yourself from the KKK, which the original KKK was a take the guns from the freemen organization, essentially. Uh, and then also your government. This is, you know, there's a dismissive thing when you say, oh, guns were the defend against your government. And then someone says, oh, yeah, you're going to fight the, you know, U.S. Army you know, you know, all the the tanks and the F-16s and whatever with your, you know, hunting rifle. Like, no. Uh, but the usually the, often the government you have to defend against is like the local sheriff in Alabama in 1876 who might only not be part of the lynch mob, but actually like running the lynch mob and they're not going to protect you. I've always thought it would have been fascinating for Thurgood Marshall to be on the bench in the Heller case because he knew – when he was traveling through the South, you know, he's one of my heroes, especially his his defense of, you know, accused black men in the South under the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He pretty much had to have someone with arms around him all the time because he's staying in these very, you know, to say the least, inhospitable places with someone sleeping on his porch with a gun because the cops aren't going to be the ones to protect you. They might be the ones to come after you. Um, and of course, uh, we also have... Um, uh, Don Cates, who's one of the sort of premier scholars in Second Amendment, he wrote the first uh, defense of the Second Amendment as an individual right published in a major law review. Uh, I think it was 1982 in the Michigan Law Review. But he was lifelong liberal, ACLU, but that's how he learned about the need for self-defense, armed self-defense, was, was participating in the civil rights movement and realizing that this stuff was necessary. The, a gun was necessary when the state is not on your side. So that those are other concerns that are just... I think are dismissed pretty pretty blithely by the gun control crowd, uh, and and especially uh, for African Americans. Yeah, you know, a lot of people are surprised to hear, for example, Martin Luther King was famously um, a proponent of um, of nonviolent resistance, and yet people who were inside his house during the civil rights era described it as an arsenal that there were guns everywhere. And uh, I would say that that virtually everybody who is familiar with that that time in our country's history and honest will acknowledge that um, many leaders of the civil rights movement have asserted credibly that guns kept them alive. Um, and you know, to go back to a point you made, I think maybe it's worth just a little bit of elaboration because it is, it is such a tired um, you know, um, canard that we hear so often that this idea that you could effectively resist a tyrannical government in the modern era with nothing more than personally owned weapons like like you know, an AR-15 or even a handgun is preposterous because the government has tanks and fighter planes. Um, you know, it, it evinces a complete misunderstanding um, of, of military tactics and, and how these things work. Um, of course, nobody can stand up to, uh, you know, a, a, an, arm, an armored assault by a bunch of tanks, um, you know, or a squadron of, uh, of, of fighter bombers. Um, but that's not how these conflicts work, right? Because in order to um, 
to oppress an entire people. You have to occupy the place where they live. You have to put individual soldiers on the ground that can go, for example, house to house and make sure that people are, you know, not meeting together to, you know, to conspire and that they don't possess things like the tools that you would need to build an, an improvised explosive device. Um, that has to be done on a retail level by individual soldiers who are absolutely vulnerable um, to uh, small arms of the kind that people can possess. You don't have to defeat the occupying power. You just have to make it so costly that they're unwilling to continue with the policy. And it's astonishing to me that people continue to make this argument in the 21st century after what we've seen you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yes, p people with small arms have done pretty well against uh, the American army in recent history, yes. Yeah, and, you know, look, I mean, it, it, it may seem preposterous and, and you know, apocalyptic that, uh, you know, Americans might ever have a valid reason to um, uh, engage in armed resistance against uh, the government of the United States or, or a particular state. And I hope that's right. I, I hope that is a completely preposterous scenario. Uh, but um, another point that I think bears emphasis is that to think of the Second Amendment as being categorically distinct from every other constitutional right um, in the sense that the Second Amendment alone has a single purpose or maybe two purposes and no other purpose, no other valid purpose. So if you're not using it to overthrow a government or you know resist tyranny on the one hand or protect your life from violent attack on the other, um, then there's no other reason why you could own a gun. Um, think how incredibly sophomoric and disrespectful it would be to consider the First Amendment as protecting freedom of speech for the sole purpose, right, of, of promoting political discourse. And if you're just trying to tell a joke, you know, or comfort uh, a grieving relative, then uh, you have no uh, protection from censorship because you're not using the First Amendment for its quote unquote purpose, right? Uh, but people who would scoff at the idea that the First Amendment has a purpose um, or even some small subset of purposes uh, will absolutely turn around, some of them and make that exact assertion uh, about the Second Amendment and essentially say, well, look, you know, unless you're using it for um, militia service or unless you're using it to resist a tyrannical government, then um, the right doesn't exist in effect. Uh, and I, I think it's no accident that those arguments, and they come in a whole variety of flavors, have been utterly unpersuasive to people who do not already embrace that position. Let's talk about, we kind of opened up by saying, you know, there are, you know, we can't just shoot down every gun control measure or other type of safety measures uh, and say, well, we can't do anything and talk about some of the things that maybe we can do, uh, when, especially when it comes to mass shootings with, you know, the proviso of what I said before, these are very, very difficult to figure out how to stop. And there are sort of three things you can, just three general categories that can, you can go after the gun, you can figure out who the shooter is beforehand. Um, or you can secure locations. Uh, uh, one of those, I think it's fairly clear that the, it's sensible to put more defense into schools. That does not mean teachers carrying weapons. That does not mean there's, a, that could mean a bunch of different things based on what the community, this should be not, you know, a federal law, what the community is comfortable with. If they are comfortable with armed service officers, maybe armed teachers, increased security of various sorts. That to me is, is just sensible. Like, unfortunately, I agree. I mean, the, going back to this, I agree that it is, it is not the world I want to live in where on, we have a, a uptick. I think, and I will continue to have an up, uptick of these tragic and disgusting shootings, because the other options are really difficult. Uh, finding the shooter, finding the gun. Uh, we already talked about how going after the gun is not terribly effective, especially when there are four hundred million guns and they're highly motivated. Can we identify the shooter? This is a little bit more possibilities here. And we're discussing red flag laws. There's a discussion in Congress right now of red flag laws and whether or not we could identify the shooter. Well, it is true that in a fair amount of these shootings, including the most recent ones, and especially for Parkland, there was a lot of notifications that this person was not okay. They had made threats. The next question is what, what can we do in terms of getting their guns? And that's that's something that's worth looking into, I would say. There's a bunch of details that you have to figure out, you know, what the due process is, how long their guns are taken away from them, and you know, what the standard of proof is. But some of these shootings could possibly have been stopped with a little bit more diligence on paying attention to the threats. I'm not sure where you on that, Clark, if you're in the same kind of place as me. Well, clearly, clearly that's true, right? Um, and I 
I think that you and I have the same policy. I never say the names of the shooters um, in part because I think that's what some of them want. And so um, I tend to refer to it as the Parkland shooter, which is the one at the high school in Florida. Um, yeah, I mean, that person was already very much on the radar screen um, of, of not only school officials, but law enforcement in that area. And to, a, to, to the point where we can look back and, and just say, how could the, you know, anyone have failed to take further steps? This is just jaw dropping. Um, so that's, that's the easiest case, right? And, and you should always go out of your way to get the easy cases right. Um, you know, there was the shooter um, who murdered a bunch of people at a church in Texas. Um, and that person was ineligible to purchase the rifle that he used because he had a domestic violence conviction while in the Air Force. And that paperwork was simply not reported to the relevant authorities. And then when they started digging into it, they discovered that it wasn't just him. It was, I think, more than a thousand um, instances. So um, these are, in effect, you know, kind of holes in the system that we could absolutely do a better job um, of shoring up. And we should, right? Where it gets challenging, and where I'm afraid that our friends, you know, um, who are strongly in favor of a more aggressive approach here, um, maybe fail to appreciate the, the nature of the challenge, is that um, it's very easy to work backwards from a known shooter and identify things that should have, you know, raised red flags. It is much more difficult to work forward. And you talk to any mental health professional, and they will tell you that it is so difficult as to be virtually impossible to identify someone who is um, imminently likely um, to commit an act of violence. Again, this doesn't mean that we simply throw up our hands and not even make an effort. Absolutely not. Instead, what it means is we've got to be very careful about to not overestimate the, our ability to predict who's going to commit an act of violence and therefore the efficacy of these policies. And so it has to be, as you suggested, Trevor, a moment ago, um, it has to be a multi-pronged effort. And no one, you know, hardening the schools is not going to be a complete fix. Um, making it more difficult to obtain these weapons will not be a complete fix. Um, and trying to identify potential shooters will not be a complete fix. But we can do better across all of those axes, and we should do better. But again, there has to be um, there has to be an awareness both of um, you know, the right of somebody to not permanently go on some list, right? Because you made a stupid joke at one point. Or um, because, for example, um, either the you know, one, one spouse or another sought mental health counseling during a particularly ugly breakup. And you know, because they went and got mental health counseling, they're on some list. That's problematic, deeply problematic. So I think that, um, uh, oh, and then one other point to make is that uh, it's also the point of unintended consequences, which you know, uh, everybody do who does public policy has an obligation, I think, to recognize. And I'll just I'll give you one example. I was actually um, at a um, a meeting of a nonprofit recently where um, one of my fellow board members was talking about a uh, a meeting that he had uh, held among the most pro gun people in the country and some of the most pro gun regulation people in the country, and a um, a point that came out that. Well, he surprised him because there was such a consensus that emerged was um, that the empirical data seems to indicate that when a jurisdiction adopts a strong red flag law, that's the one that, that enables um, you know somebody to go into court, whether it's a police officer or somebody else, and say, look, I think this particular person represents an imminent threat, and I need a court order. Um, we need a court order to take away their their firearms, um, which which a number of jurisdictions have. Um, that when a jurisdiction adopts a red flag law, what you'll see is that uh, military veterans suddenly start seeking mental health treatment at a much lower rate than before uh, for a number of reasons, um, including because they're concerned that um, someone will come and take their guns. Now, maybe you just take that as a necessary consequence of the policy, but to fail to be aware that that is likely to happen is incredibly irresponsible. And the same goes for all unintended consequences, including, for example, that that as you suggested earlier, many of these shooters are actually as as um, mentally ill as they obviously are. That doesn't necessarily mean that they lack the capacity for rational thought and for incredibly detailed planning. And some of them will absolutely take proactive measures, like hiding their weapons somewhere, if they begin to suspect they might be the you know the uh, subject of a. Of, of someone trying to implement one of these red flag laws, right? So again, that doesn't mean you don't try, but you have to be realistic about what you know is going to happen in the real world and not your idealized version of it. And that gets into a really important point about the the 
kind of makeup of gun deaths in the country. And, and first thing here is to, whenever you see such data published by whoever it is, the New York Times, Cato, check whether it says gun deaths or gun homicides, uh, because gun deaths will include suicides, which are about two thirds of gun deaths in America. And the thing that frustrates me is, is the discussion of policy proposals that will have nothing, no effect on suicide magazine restrictions, for example. Um, Elizabeth Warren, when she was running, still running for president, put forward, I think, a 32 point plan to what she said, reduce gun deaths by 80%. Only one of those points addressed suicide at all. And so even so, even if she was able to eliminate all gun and homicides, she still would only eliminate thirty three percent of gun deaths. So it doesn't even make sense within her own calculus, and it's very frustrating because right, right now we have upticks in suicide. I think pandemic related to some extent, but for men between the ages of twenty five and sixty four, uh, that is around thirty seven percent of gun deaths, uh, and, and then young black males. Uh, connect to the drug war, shooting each other. And any policy that tries to lower gun deaths by 50% that ignores the heart of these, where the gun deaths are. And I, I personally think that, you know, suicide prevention is something where there can be more gains from gun control policies because suicide by gun is often a quick, rash decision that is that you can't take back and, and often involving substance abuse. And so some of the, and people who commit suicide, 50% or so of them reach out to someone in the months or weeks beforehand, uh, looking for help. Uh, and we cannot dissuade that with a red, red flag law. This would be actually catastrophic, really, if people who own guns and are getting massively reported because they're depressed, let's say, and then they don't seek help, uh, because they're afraid of this, this would be a really, it would cause more problems than people really expect. Uh, so, I, I, I'm open to many discussions on what to do with suicide. I think that people should be aware of this. And if, they're, if their loved one or their friend seems to be in a bad place, see, ask them if, you know, they could take, I'll keep your guns for a couple of weeks, you know, just so you're not, you're not in this bad situation. There just needs to be much, much more awareness of who are actually dying with guns and which guns are doing it and under what circumstances. So suicide prevention and the other one, in the drug war. Not to sound like a broken record in, in the libertarian sphere, but the, that would do more than any gun policy to lower gun homicides in the inner city than, than any reasonable gun policy that could be imposed. I think that's right. I mean, it's very difficult to find numbers to support that, right? But what we do know is that there's probably no more powerful generator of criminal activity, including violent crime, than a black market. Uh, we saw this with alcohol prohibition between 1920 and 1933 when violent crime rates across America um, spiked. We see it with the drug trade, and it's obvious why this would be the case, right? Because a black market naturally attracts uh, people who excel at the use of force to eliminate competitors um, and to protect their market share. Um, if you're if you're very proficient at violence, but not so good at product distribution or development or marketing, you can still flourish in a black market, right? And, 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 and they do, people do. So, so that is a, you know, I, I think self-evidently um, is a problem. And of course, the other thing with, with homicides, including gun homicides, um, is that they are unlike other crimes in a very important way, which is that they tend to provoke a cycle of retribution. Um, so that, you know, particularly, you know, when, when a member of one group, it could be just a neighborhood or a grant gang or other discernible group, um, commits an act of violence against someone outside of that group, there is very often going to be retribution. And these things become cyclical. Uh, so if we can prevent that first killing from happening, um, then it, it, there's a strong likelihood that we also will prevent a number of downstream murders that uh, that are likely to occur as, as acts, acts of retribution. And so if you have a policy, in this case, drug prohibition, that sets this, not only sets the stage for it, but engenders a tremendous amount of violence that wouldn't occur otherwise, um, that's, you're, you're paying an enormous cost for that policy. Now, maybe, maybe that doesn't mean you get rid of the policy, but if you refuse to even to acknowledge that your policy comes with this cost, that is, that you have created uh, a black market, which is, again, probably the most powerful generator of criminal activity, including violent crime known um, to man, then uh, you're being incredibly irresponsible uh, as a policymaker. Uh, and so uh, I think two things are true, right? 
we could almost get tremendous gain. We almost certainly get tremendous gains if we would eliminate the drug war. We would almost certainly see a significant drop um, in gun homicides. And to go back to your point about gun suicides, which again are represent about two thirds of all um, deaths caused by guns. Um, Imagine that you had to choose between putting all of your resources, your public policy resources, um, into providing sort of better mental health support uh, for for people who you know who are potentially suicidal, or you could choose to spend no money on that and all of your money in essentially trying to take make sure that none of them possess a gun. I just can't fathom that you wouldn't. If you again, you don't have to make this choice, but if you did. Um, and I think it's a helpful exercise, right? Because it points us in the direction of, of, I think, appreciating that you are much more likely to get a significant return on your investment of public resources um, if you're trying to combat the problem of suicide by trying to make sure that essentially you identify people who are feeling that way and provide them with the support that they need to no longer wish to take their own lives than if you put those same resources to work trying to deprive them of the means to take their own lives. I agree with you, by the way. I think that to a, to a high degree of certainty, lives would be saved if um, if at least some people didn't have easy access um, to a firearm when they when they are you know contemplating suicide. Um, but that's not a complete solution by any stretch. And um, and it seems to me that we should be looking for for in a sense the kind of the low hanging policy fruit here. Where can we get the most return? Um, on the investment of public policy dollars and helping people emotionally who are feeling suicidal is very clearly one of those areas. And as you pointed out, and of course this is us, you know, showing, showing our libertarian colors. But I don't think this should be lightly dismissed. Taking a fresh look at the drug war and saying, you know, is this really worth the cost that we're paying for it, and and the cost of creating this black market that that has demonstrably uh, engendered tremendous amounts of crime in, in both inside the United States and like, let's keep in mind also outside the United States, um, where it has had tragic consequences for people in um, developing countries, um, uh, in, including Mexico and Colombia and other places around the world. So anyway, it's um, it's a complex problem, right? So at the end of the day, um, the, 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 the issue of gun deaths is a very complex problem, one that for a variety of reasons, I think, um, inclines people um, to, to advance um, uh, sometimes overly simplistic uh, policies that, that, that fail to take into account um, the, the limitations on our ability to implement those policies in the real world, um, give short shrift to the legitimate interests of people who um, you know, uh, wish to exercise their constitutional right um, to keep and bear arms, um, and that, um, that uh, sort of systematically overestimates the efficacy of those uh, uh, policies while systematically undercounting the, uh, uh, the, the consequences, including unintended consequences that are difficult to quantify, and uh, we can and should do better. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.